Hey there, gang. Time for another comic book unboxing, and this is actually part two of yesterday's box. We did not get quite all the way through that box. We cut it for time, and so we are picking up where we left off, and we're taking a look at the second half, or as you kind of look at this photo, the bottom half of uh, this box that we're looking at here. So if you like comic books, stick around. We're going to have some fun. Hey there, Bubby. Welcome to Shanghala. My name is Duke, and this is an unboxing video. And yes, indeed, this is part two of yesterday's box. Yesterday, uh, we had a lot of Silver Age DC and uh, a lot of uh, early Legion stories and adventure comics. And of course, I'm a big Legion fan. This whole channel is named after a Legion setting, Shanghala, the asteroid cemetery, final resting place of the greatest superheroes from across the galaxy. And we actually saw the first appearance of Shanghala. Oh, you know what? I'm actually, I, I'll take it out and actually show it to you this time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it out and show it to you. That's what she said, right? Uh, and usually that's what he said. <laughs> but uh, I think uh, I'm, as I speak here, I'm looking for that, that particular issue. But I will show you the actual first on-panel appearance. The last time I showed you the cover, this time we'll take a look at the first on-panel appearance of Shang Hollow. Uh, but anyway... Uh, we're going to deal with the second half of the box this time, and I think we had turned a corner. We were looking at some Marvel stuff when we left. So please do like, share, subscribe, comment away, do all the groovy things. And um, here we are. So this was uh, Adventure Comics 341, and uh, this is uh, some Kurt Swan art. And so that's the weirdo Legionnaire. That's actually uh, the little... Um, protoplasmic creature Prody in disguise and normally Prody could only speak telepathically uh, and only only to like telepaths like Saturn girl but apparently when he changed into this uh, this character he gained the power of speech somehow but anyway uh, triplicate girl had been killed in the last issue one of her bodies destroyed there it is a uh, sort of a recap and so they thought she was all dead but uh, as it turns out, it's just one of her bodies. But anyway, they interred her remains and sent them to Shanghala. And here it is. There is the asteroid cemetery. There is the capsule landing. A lot smaller here than it would uh, appear later on, although it always has had kind of that central beacon. And this is a famous panel. This is uh, the memorial of some of the different characters. And this is the one I use as the avatar for this channel, Hate Face. The face of a devil, the soul of an angel. <laughs> and what describes me better than the face of the devil, the soul of an angel. <laughs> um, but anyway... You know, different. Uh, you know, some of these uh, some of these heroes died. Uh, uh, you know, fighting great threats to the galaxy. Here is a Beast Boy, uh, who we already knew he had uh, died, so we knew that his remains had been interred here as well. He was a member of the the Heroes of Lalor. But just as some of the um, some of the great heroes died fighting villains like uh, like Nimbok of Valor and uh, Moss Moss Yagor. But you also had Lita 87, who died because she slipped on a, ban a banana peel. <laughs> oh, I, I think they call it a banyo fruit. Let me look at it here. I forget what it was called. It's a um, banyo. A banyo fruit peel <laughs> is what she slipped on. It's a banana. <laughs> so, so some of the heroes uh, interred on Shanghala did meet kind of uh, ignominious ends. But anyway... Like I said, uh, if you uh, if you want to if you want to uh, obtain for your own comic book collection the issue uh, the setting after which this channel is named, then you do need Adventure Comics number three forty one. All right, let's pick up where we left off yesterday. This is the return of Jean Grey, which was kind of a big deal. Uh, she's died and come back several times since then, but this is the first appearance of X Factor. In Fantastic Four 286, here's a nice Silver Age Green Lantern. So I guess we're not done with the Silver Age DC issues yet. That's number 26, Star Sapphire. Number 42, Zatanna. 
And Zatanna at this time, I think this is part of that. She was appearing, uh, it, again, it was uh, one of the first multi-part epics. Uh, she was appearing in several different uh, DC titles, looking for her father, who was the Golden Age hero Zatara, uh, the magician who first appeared alongside Superman in Action Comics number one. And uh, she would eventually find him, I th where was it, in Justice League? But uh, yeah. I don't, this isn't uh, her first appearance, but it would be one of her first appearance. I believe this is part of that, uh, that multi-part saga. Here's an appearance of the Golden Age Green Lantern of Earth 2, GL61. X-Men 205. I'm not sure if that's a, if that's a quote-unquote key issue. The last video I was making fun of how, uh, how freely people throw away the term key these days. But uh, I don't know if that's a key issue or if it's just all by itself. We think we'll get at least 10 bucks for that. Here's 203, part of the Secret Wars 2 kind of non-saga. It was kind of nothing special. First appearance of uh, the Angel as Archangel with the metal wings, which I never liked. I wish he'd go back to the uh, regular wings. Although we need some other superpower. Just having wings really isn't... I mean, yeah, you're a mutant if you have wings, obviously. But um, it's really not enough power. He needs to be able to, I don't know, talk to birds, control birds, something. Uh, but there's uh, issue 24 of X Factor. Here's the uh, first full appearance of Apocalypse. And uh, X Factor number 6. Oh, nice! First appearance of Booster Gold. In Booster Gold number one. Nice, from 1986. Very, very nice. I bought this issue in Waterville, Maine, at one of the uh, first comic book stores in the state. It was a place called the Comic Vault. Uh, it was opened inside an old post office uh, back when the uh, post office was abandoning all of the uh, old classic buildings in the centers of towns and building great monolithic um, boxes. <laughs> and I use great in the pejorative sense here because they certainly were not the architectural showcases the early post offices were. They were just these big boxes on the edges of towns. And so the uh, the old classic Greek Revival post office in downtown Waterville was closed. And they tried, they've tried several times to make something out of it. And uh, at this point, they were trying to make kind of a mini mall out of it with uh, you know, different rooms being different stores. And so the, the room that had the, uh, the post office's actual vault was turned into a comic book store, and it was called the Comic Vault. And that's where I bought my, my issue of Booster Gold number one that I have to this very day. So there you go, from 1986, first appearance of Booster Gold. Uh, here is uh, first appearance of Mr. Sinister, X-Men 221. And I've, I've told you before in early videos, I haven't mentioned it in a while, so it's worth mentioning again if you're new, but uh, the owner, co-owner of my company, uh, he got his start flipping this issue. He would uh, buy it low on eBay, you know, use some sniping software, get in there, buy it low, and then, uh, and then flip it. And so that's kind of how he got his start. I've never had any luck with that. I, I, I don't know why, but I mean, I buy a book and I... I just can't seem to sell it. For It's one of the reasons I'm not an investor and I'm just a collector is I've never had any luck flipping books. You know, I just end up spending money I don't have and not making that money back or just breaking even. So, <laughs> that's why I'm not the boss. Uh, here is uh, Action Comics 283. And this one has got a couple of your Legion collector. It's got a couple of minor uh, ties to the Legion in here. I forget exactly what they are, but... Uh, it's there. New Mutants Annual number two, and that's the first U.S. appearance of Psylocke, who first appeared in uh, Marvel UK books. Betsy Braddock, the sister of Captain Britain. This is Sandman number. It's hard to make out the issue number. It's number number four. So I don't know. Is that the first appearance of Death or Destiny? One of the dreaming. I would say. Here is the. First appearance of Dick Grayson as Nightwing in uh, Tales of the Teen Titans, number 44. It's also the origin of Jericho, I believe. And although this costume is a little busy, uh, I've always 
I've always disliked the regular, the more modern Nightwing costume. It's just very plain to me. So I've always wanted, um, I've always wanted Nightwing to adopt maybe like the, um, the Red Robin costume. You know, more of a pulpy noir feel. But anyway, this one, uh, this one's kind of gay. <laughs> And I know we're not supposed to call things gay anymore, but it was kind of... See, Batman's even. He's like, that's so gay. <laughs> All right. Um, see, he can't even stand up. He's just so... So shocked by that. Here is uh, Batman Year One, Part One. That's a popular book. That always goes for decent money. Vengeance of Bane, Number One. First appearance of Bane. This is a nice cover. I really enjoyed this cover when it came out. And that is uh, Wonder Woman number 184, meeting her Golden Age counterpart, at least on the cover anyway. Oh, sweet! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, so we, we did a bunch of Adventure Comics uh, issues in the uh, last video. This one uh, kind of snuck in here in the second half, but this is the a classic cover. And this is the beginning of the Legion series in Adventure Comics that ran from issue number 300 to 380. And 80 issues was a long, long run in those days. And uh, so, yeah, yeah, nice. The story itself in this issue is not much, frankly. Um, you know, th this is one of those cases. And I get, I get so frustrated with people that, you know, they buy and sell comic books and they just talk about the covers and, you know, they, they forget to read the actual story, you know. And maybe that's a, a function of the whole slabbing phenomenon where, like, nobody cares about actually reading the story. Not is it a great issue and worth a lot, but is it a great story? Well, this is one of those ones where you almost don't need to read the story because there's nothing to it. It's not that good a story. It involves um, Lex Luthor sending a robot duplicate of himself called Erthulo, or whatever Luthor is backwards. And, uh, and for some reason, he made the robot duplicate an adult version. I don't know. Um, and so it went back to attack the Legion. And the, the significance of the story is that mon who had been trapped in the Phantom Zone, uh, back in Superboy's time, is finally freed. He, he's not freed permanently, but he does come out uh, of the Phantom Zone in the 30th century and joins the Legion of Superheroes. And a few issues later, I think 304, 305, uh, they would come up with a cure and he would come out permanently uh, for his lead poisoning. He was in the Phantom Zone for... And, you know, it's not really something that's harped on, but uh, that's one of the great failures of Superman that, you know, because he trapped mon -El well, not really trapped, but consigned him to the Phantom Zone as a way to sort of preserve his life until he could come up with a cure for the lead poisoning that was killing him. And obviously, by virtue of the fact that uh, he stayed in the Phantom Zone all the way to the 30th century, Superboy and then later Superman never found a cure for mon -El. So he failed. <laughs> he failed miserably. Uh, but anyway... Uh, mon -El makes his first appearance in the 30th century and joins the Legion in this issue. So it is a key story, but again, the story itself is kind of ridiculous. And uh, there's a great panel where uh, the, the chest plate of Urthulo is broken open, and inside you can see what he runs on, and it's these magnetic tapes. <laughs> <laughs> the old tape deck in his chest, and and the tapes are labeled hate, hate, hate. <laughs> that was his programming. Uh, but anyway, it's just funny. You know, it, it was high science at the time, but looking back on it, it's kind of silly. Uh, so this is the death of the Earth 2 Batman, Adventure Comics number 462. The Justice Society had its own series in All-Star Comics, and then All-Star Comics got canceled as part of the, um, the infamous DC implosion. And so the stories that had been produced for All-Star Comics, uh, but not yet published, they were kind of split in two and printed as two-part stories in uh, subsequent issues of Adventure Comics, and then they moved on to, I, I can't remember if this was actually going to appear in All-Star Comics, or if this is one of the first new stories for Adventure Comics. I, th I think it was scheduled for uh, All-Star Comics originally. Maybe they hadn't got all the way to drawing it yet, I don't know. But anyway, uh, this, uh, this is the death of the Earth 2 Batman, and that's his daughter, Huntress, if you don't know. If you're familiar with the character Huntress, Initially, she was introduced as the daughter of Batman and Catwoman. 
uh, on Earth too. And to my mind, that's always what Huntress is. Any of these other Huntresses are just, you know, lame-ass pretenders. This is a, a British book you can see here. Now it's got the it's got a U.S. price on it, but it does have a nine pence sticker, uh, not sticker, stamp on the cover. So that indicates that this book was one that was sold over in Great Britain somewhere. Here is Justice League number dark color. I can't see the issue number. There it is, 56. That's a JLA JSA team up. Sweet. 34 pages. So this is missing a couple of pages. Somebody's already counted. Prob well, I don't know if it was originally in here. I can't feel. I have gotten so that I can, you know, when I pick up a book, I can feel if it's missing pages just by the, you know, the feel of it. But uh, I would, I, I couldn't feel this one, not, not in this backing board anyway. So I don't know if the, uh, if the owner put it in here or if it came with this on it. I don't know. But anyway, that's missing a couple of pages, and so that will either be graded as a zero incomplete. Or, if those pages don't affect the story at all, I might give it a 0-5. So, anyway. This is cool. This was, I love Murphy Anderson. Uh, and this is uh, some classic Murphy Anderson art on a team-up of Starman and Black Canary. Two Earth-2 two Golden Age characters that never got revived for Earth-1. As I said in the last video, you know, after... After they reintroduced the Justice Society, they sort of stopped updating the uh, the heroes from the Golden Age, and so because uh, you know Starman and Black Canary had not been updated yet, alongside the Atom, the Flash, Green Lantern, Hawkman, uh, they never got an Earth One revival, and it's so it's just sort of it's just sort of fun to pretend like if these characters had been introduced you know, as new versions for the Silver Age, how might they have changed them? I mean, the zeitgeist of the Silver Age was less the, you know, the, uh, the man of mystery, two-faced, uh, um, two-faced, <laughs> two-fisted, <laughs> two-faced was a villain, uh, two-fisted man of action, you know, righting wrongs and taking on, uh, evildoers and bank robbers, um, to, you know, um, the whole, uh, positive, forward-looking, right stuff, age of science type of thing. And so Starman was already pretty much in that mold, so I can't imagine how they would have changed Starman much. Black Canary, she's a character of the streets, um, although having her canary cry, I think she uses it here, and it, it was new. She never had a canary cry, I don't believe, in the Golden Age. Uh, that was uh, something that uh, she got in the Silver Age, so she was kind of updated. But um, anyway, she wasn't a different person. And originally, she came over from Earth 2 to Earth 1. Then they, later, they did this thing where enough time had passed there that they were like, well, you know, if the Justice Society is still going to be tied to, you know, with the World War II era, they can't have a Green Arrow dating a chick who's in her 60s. <laughs> so they did this whole story where uh, the uh, Black Canary on Earth 1 was actually the daughter of the original Black Canary. But anyway, <clears throat> there's that. This, I think, is the... Uh, uh, I don't know if this is the first appearance of Wildcat in the Silver Age. I don't think it is. But is it the first appearance of Sportsmaster and the Huntress? That's the original Huntress. Uh, the villainous Huntress. Forget, forget what the key is there. Big old key. Everything's a key. Everything's a key issue. Gotta, gotta get that investment up. Uh, so Brave and the Bold, before it was converted to all Batman team-ups, would team up just any two random heroes. So here is the Manhunter from Mars, John Johns, and the Flash teaming up in kind of a, a composite. You've heard of the composite Superman. This is the composite Flash. Brave and the Bold, nice. This is an early appearance of Hawkman and Hawk Girl. Uh, the first appearance of the Shadow Thief. And I don't know if that's uh, his first, second, third, no, not first, but second, third appearance overall. I'll have to look it up. Still 10 cents. And it's got a stamp on it. What is the stamp? I'm going to take a look here. Huh. So you Canadian viewers uh, might be interested. Uh, maybe this uh, maybe this place is still there, but this, this uh, 
shop. This was originally sold, and I would say sold secondhand, at um, Mel and Olive's Variety in uh, Grand Bend, Ontario. That's what that stamp says. So I would I would presume that it was sold there secondhand. Not, um, but maybe, maybe this was sold new there. Don't know. But that's kind of neat. Here's a, uh, this is a popular issue just because it's uh, a, an early and also rare team up of the chicks. Supergirl and Wonder Woman, Brave and the Bold, number 63. This one is also a popular issue. Uh, the Flash and the Doom Patrol, Brave and the Bold, number 65. Here's Batman and Green Arrow. So this is kind of at the beginning. And is this? No, I don't think it is. I don't think this is the issue where um, Green Arrow gets updated. Let's look. I don't think it is. I can't really remember what issue number that is. Where he gets you know, the classic goatee look. That's a Neil Adams thing. And I would think that would have a Neil Adams cover too. But let's take a look. No, it's not. So this is still the, um, the original... Um, you know, Green Arrow is basically Batman with a bow. <laughs> so that's what that's the team up you've got going on there. Cool. Cool beans. All right, I gotta make some room here, get some of these books out of the way. And let's keep on keeping on. So here he is. Now by this time the uh, Batman team ups have begun. This is a character called Copperhead. And uh, Batman and Wonder Woman with Batgirl. So that's cool. This is nice, Batman and the Creeper. And I think this would be uh, roughly concurrent with the Creepers series. His, uh, his Beware the Creepers series lasted, I think, six issues. He had a first appearance in Showcase and then a six-issue six series of his own. That, that's pretty scary. That right there, that's, that character, is, that'll give you nightmares. Whoops. Uh, so here we're uh, switching over to Marvel, Submariner number two with Triton. Number three, another number three, number four. Love these John Buscema covers. Here's the one with uh, number seven. Now, I did I did find the thread uh, that I had mentioned the last time we looked at this book on the uh, comic book historians uh, group on Facebook. And we had discussed this. I had introduced the uh, question of what is this actually a picture of? And uh, I thought we had decided, but apparently, uh, at least as the thread exists currently, there is no final resolution as to what this actually is. It was pretty well decided that it's not not uh, a JFK memorial, and it's probably not, you know, some of the candidates that were thrown out would have had a lot of ticker tape. You know, the air would be, you know, just replete with uh, ticker tape. So it doesn't appear to be some kind of celebratory thing like that. But it's definitely New York City, uh, and uh, some people even identified what street it was. But we couldn't nail down exactly what it was. And most people thought it was some kind of Eisenhower uh, motorcade. You know, people didn't think that it was probably a parade, but never could figure out exactly what it was. That's a popular issue, uh, Thing versus Submariner. This is only the... <laughs> second or third appearance of Werewolf by Night. I think his first appearance was in Marvel Spotlight number two. I like Mar Mike Plug. He, uh, he learned well as part of the Will Eisner studio. Here's an early issue of uh, Amazing Adventures with the, uh, the Beast series. At this point, he's still gray. They would eventually change him over to blue just because uh, you know the, the gray didn't, didn't print well inside. You can see that he just ends up looking like, like there's, <laughs> that's just a page of mud. <laughs> and it doesn't help that they're coloring the backgrounds gray too. But the, the gray coloring with the black ink, it just, you know, you can't really make anything out. So they would change him to blue just, you know, just for highlighting. But he really shouldn't be blue in the movies. Here's number 13 featuring uh, Eunice. As a kid, I used to I used to delight in calling him Anus, um, but that's that's not his name. <laughs> and there's another one for you. 
Number 14. 15. I had this one as a kid, and then it went in the house fire. And I think I've since replaced it. I'm pretty sure I have. Juggernaut. Number 17. The Origin of the Beast. So, there you go. What do you think of that? And there's uh, Kazar. I saw, I heard a, a recent unboxing video, and somebody pronounced it as Kazar. Uh, but I've always, I always pronounced it Kazar. I put the emphasis on the second syllable. How do you, how do you pronounce it? Here's Howard the Deck number one. Howard the Deck. Howard, Howard the Dick. <laughs> <laughs> which, which he frankly was a lot of the time. But he's not Howard the Dick. He's Howard the Duck. Uh, <laughs> number one. Tales to Astonish. Hulk and Subby. Uh, just a random backing board. A couple of them. There's the cat. All you feminists out there, you need to get this issue. I believe that is the first... Um, no, it's not the first solo series starring a female. I take that back. Marvel in the Golden Age had some female titles. But this one is um, written by a female, drawn by a female, starring a female. So much female. She stalks the night. Da -da -da. Only lasted four issues, though. Marvel Spotlight number three. So I believe this is the second appearance of Werewolf by Night. And there's two of them. This one has... Some splotching up here, and you get this. Well, actually, no, that's that, that might not be what that is. I was going to show you distributor ink, but um, that's not it. And this is there you go. I'm surprised this didn't go to CGC. That's probably, I mean, I'll, I'll grade it more completely. Oh, it's got some scribbling here on the cover. Somebody wrote 10 cents on it, so this was probably sold at a lawn sale or something at some point. But that's the first appearance of Werewolf by Night. And I was going to say I'm surprised it didn't go to CGC as such, but I guess it's got some issues issues on it. What If? I believe that's the first Spider-Girl. Spider-Girl, Spider-Girl. Does whatever a spider whirl. I don't know. <laughs> uh, this is the, uh, the Whitman edition of the uh, Star Wars number 2. There's the Whitman Star Wars number three. You can tell by the diamond box and the no UPC code. There's another number two. Here's another number three. Here's another number three. And we're getting towards the end of the box here. Good. And I think it's going to be more modern stuff the rest of the way. I'll have to look at the analytics to see if people tune out at this point. <laughs> well, they probably already have. <laughs> Here is, uh, well, I guess you could call it the first appearance of the Soviet Super Schultz. Well, that's hard to say. Soviet Super Soldiers. Say that five times fast. Soviet Super Soldiers. So no, I can't do it. <laughs> Soviet Super Soldiers. So nice. I can't even do it once. <laughs> uh, what you've got? Dark Star, Crimson Dynamo. I think he's called the Proletariat. And uh, Ursa Major. What if the Hulk had become a barbarian? My goodness, what if indeed? Here's uh, some Thor. So they're not all modern. We got some Silver Age stuck in there. But there's uh, the regular the regular edition of Star Wars number six. That is the uh, the last issue adapting the the movie. So it took six issues to uh, tell the story of what you know as Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope. Uh, to people of my vintage, it's just Star Wars. <laughs> but uh, And I believe the first two and maybe three issues came out before the movie. Uh, I can't remember if it was this box or the last one. We saw the first U.S. appearance of Psylocke. Here is the first U.S. appearance of her brother, Captain Britain. Here is a Captain Marvel with Nitro. X-Men 191, I think that's the first Nimbus, Nimrod, Nimbok, somebody. Somebody. Here's a newsstand version of that same thing. First appearance of Bishop. The uh, quote-unquote iconic cover by Jim Lee. I don't think this is a very good cover, but, you know, a lot of people do. Uh, so I guess, you know, taste vary. You know, don't, don't take my word for anything. Rom Space Knight. 
love ROM. And I'm only an issue two away from completing my run of ROM. And some of them I had to go back and recollect because I lost the first few issues uh, in that house fire we had in 1980. And, uh, and then after that, I don't think, after the fire, I didn't really collect ROM. You know, I had to be a little more choosy at that point. My, my $2 weekly allowance went away for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and also comic book prices were going up. And I think I was I was in high school before I it was able to negotiate an increase to five bucks a week. But uh, anyway, so after the fire, I didn't really collect ROM that much. And plus, the toy had gone away. So you know, to my kid brain, that was like well, blah, blah, blah. but it really is a good series written by Bill Mantlo. And I did uh, I did go back and recollect it. Uh, and a lot of them I bought and I haven't read yet. Uh, I'm waiting till I get the whole thing done, and I'm only a couple issues away. These are not, except for the first issue, not terribly expensive issues. You can get them for, you know, a few bucks each. But once I once I get that done, I think it lasted 75 issues. I'm looking forward to sitting down and reading the whole run. Marvel Superhero Secret Wars, it used to be it was only issue 8 that mattered, but now there are several issues. That's the first appearance of this Spider-Woman, and she was only a thing for like a hot second, so I don't know why why that's considered a quote-unquote key issue. And this is the first appearance of something or somebody, and I forget what. I have to look it up every time. Here's uh, Werewolf by Night 39. That's uh, an appearance by Brother Voodoo. So that makes that a popular issue. And we're down to it, boys and girls. This is the last stack in this box. Took us two videos to get through because it was a schlong. <laughs> uh, but uh, you'll... Little editorial footnote there down at the bottom of the panel. See last issue. Uh, <laughs> there's number one. Here's three again. Here's seven again. Here's another one of those we saw just a moment ago. Number 34. Alpha Flight 33. And this was a dollar issue for a long time, and I forget why this is. This is another one. I, again, for some reason. The things that I've discovered are keys within the last few years. I, I just can't get them to sink in my brain. I can't figure out, I can't remember why this one is a key issue, and I have to keep looking it up. But it's also because a lot of things that they say are keys these days are like, yeah, that's that's not a key. Peacemaker. This one is taking off uh, because of the um, somewhat surprising popularity of the second Suicide Squad movie which is feeding interest in the upcoming series starring John Cena. And so Peacemaker, when he appeared in Charlton Comics, they played him pretty straight. But when they brought him over to DC and updated him, uh, that's when they started going this, uh, this whole, you know, ultra-nationalistic, um, alt-right, uh, the, the code name being ironic because he kills to keep the peace. And so there's number one of his miniseries, and so that one's kind of taking off a little bit. Submariner 59 with a Thor battle. What if number one? Always a, uh, a popular issue, and that one's fairly high grade. Little little ding here, a little piece tearing off, but other than that. And there we have uh, another Whitman edition of Star Wars number two, and that's it. That's everything in that box. And so I thank you very much for uh, taking the time to go through those with me. I will see you again next time out. And until then, goodbye, good luck, and please be good to each other.